What's up my precog people? In this video, we're gonna talk about the second free response question that you're gonna see on the AP Precalculus exam. Now, College Board has laid out an awesome framework for exactly what this question is gonna look like. And in this video, we're gonna talk about that framework and then we're gonna look at a full example that follows that framework. Now, the full example that we're gonna take a look at is in the course exam description that your teacher probably has. So I hope maybe you've actually already seen this problem. Now, here's the one thing I can promise you, is that when you open up the AP exam in May, the second FRQ is not gonna look identical to this question that I'm gonna go over with you in this video. But what I can promise you is the framework of it is going to be exactly the same. So going through this problem and hopefully many, many more that you'll see in my ultimate review packet are gonna help you prepare. That way, when you do open up that question, you're gonna be ready for it. Let's take a look at it right now. The second FRQ of the AP Precalculus exam involves modeling a non-periodic scenario presented in real life context. And you can use a graphing calculator on this problem. Now, here we're looking at a real world scenario not involving a sinusoidal function. So we're gonna be looking at either a polynomial, a piecewise function, exponential function, logarithmic function. Now in part A, you're gonna be given the information you need to construct a function model, and you're gonna to have to build a system of equations using two pieces of information. And then once you have those two pieces of information and you create two equations, you could solve for the parameters of the problem. And there's a couple different ways that you could do that solving. Now in part B, students are gonna calculate, apply, and reason with average rates of change. So make sure you understand how to find average rates of change, which is really easy. We'll demonstrate that in this video. In part C, students justify a conclusion about assumptions or limitations of the model. So again, it's pretty laid out exactly what part A, part B, and part C are gonna look like. You just don't know the real world scenario that it's gonna be on there. All right, let's take a look at FRQ2 from the course exam description. Students who completed a class participated in a year-long study to see how much content from the class they retained over the following year. At the end of the class, students completed the initial test to determine the group's content knowledge. At time t equals zero, the group of students achieved a score of 75 out of 100 points. For the next 12 months, the group was evaluated at the end of each month to track the retention of the content. After three months, the group's score was 70.84. So every single month, the kids were given a similar test to see how much they remembered from what they learned last year. At the very end of last year, they remembered 75 out of 100 points. That's what they achieved. And then again, three months later, they had 70.84 points, so they retained a little bit less. Now, the group's score could be modeled by the function r given by a plus b natch log of t plus 1, where r of t is the score in points for month t, and t is the number of months since the initial test. Now, it already tells us, just from looking at the two pieces of information we have, is that as the months go by, the score is going to get lower. All right, so part A is use the given data to write two equations that can be used to find the values for constants A and B in the expression for R, and then actually find the values of A and B. So the two pieces of information we have are that at time zero, they had a score of 75, and at time three, they had a score of 70.84. So what we have to do is build two equations using that information. So here we go. Using those two pieces of information, I'm going to build the equations. Now I have the model, and I'm just going to substitute everything in. So at time zero, so on the left-hand side here, I substituted in a zero for t, and the score, that's the r value, was 75. So 75 here, and then a zero right here, and then zero plus one got me that one. So there is my first equation that I'm going to use. The second equation is what happens at three months. So again, I'm gonna plug in three for t, and then the output I get was 70.84. 3 plus 1 was the 4. Remember, inside of the natural log is a t plus 1, so that's how I got a 4 there. So now I have my two equations, and the only thing that's unknown in each of these is a and b. So that is part a, just building those two equations. Now for the second part of part a, I now have to actually solve for a and b. And this is actually quite easy. Now, first, I'm gonna work with the equation on the left. The natural log of one is something that you should know very easily. The natural log of one is zero. If you're looking for a little bit of a proof to that, here it is. 
Well, the base of natural log is E. So if I don't know what this answer is, I'm thinking E raised to what equals one? Well, anything raised to the zero is one. So E raised to zero is one, which means the natural log of one is zero. That's awesome because B times zero is completely gone. And all I get is that A equals 75. So I already have one of my two parameters solved for. Now I'm going to use substitution. I'm going to take that A value and substitute it in over here for my a value in the second equation so that I can now solve. So I substituted that a value in right here, 75. You see that? And now I have to solve. So I'm going to subtract the 75 over and I get negative 4.16. And then I'm going to divide by the natural log of 4. Now remember, the natural log of 4 is just a value. So I could get that on my calculator. So now I'm going to use my calculator to take negative 4.16, divided by the natural log of 4, and I get a B value of negative 3.000806, which I'm going to round to negative 3.001. And now I'm just going to substitute the A and the B value that I have back into my original equation to get a final answer of R of T equals 75 minus 3.001 times the natural log of T plus 1. So that's it for part A. The first part of part A, I use the given information to build two equations. The second part of part A, I solve those two equations using substitution, and I got this final equation. Okay, now for part B. This is the part that's going to deal with rates of change. There's three parts to part B in this particular problem. First says use the given data to find the average rate of change of the scores in points per month from t equals zero to t equals three months. Express your answer as a decimal approximation. Show the computations that lead to your answer. All right, let's walk through how I did that. So first, how do you find average rate of change over an interval A to B? Well, this is really simple. You just take your output of B minus your output of A divided by B minus A. Very, very simple to find average rate of change. So it's basically subtracting your Y's, subtracting your X's in the denominator, and getting that ratio. It's basically finding the slope between the two points. All right, so now all I got to do is take my two points. The first point was 0, 75. The second point was 3, 78.85. And I'm just going to substitute that into my average rate of change equation. So I'm going to take 70.84 minus 75. I get negative 4.16. And then in my denominator is the change of my X's or the change of my T's in this specific problem, which is 3 minus 0. So negative 4.16 divided by 3, by 3 is negative 1.387. It did say give a decimal approximation. So again, you're definitely going to need to calculate it for that. Now, the second part of part B says to interpret the meaning of your answer from part one in the context of the problem. So basically, we want to explain what that rate of change is. And that rate of change simply tells us that on average, there is a loss or a decrease because it's negative. So there's a loss of 1.387 points per month for the group score. So for every month, the group score is going to decrease on average by 1.387 points. Now for part three of part B, consider the average rate of change from R from T to three, or T equals three to T equals P months, where P is greater than three. So let's make sure we understand what's happening here. We just looked at T equals zero to T equals three. They now want us to consider a new interval looking at T equals three to T equals P, where P is simply greater than three. So we're looking at what's going on after three. We know what's going on from zero to three, what's going on from three towards, you know, not necessarily infinity, but three to four to five to six to seven for values greater than three. Are these average rates of change less or equal than the average rate of change from zero to three? All right, so we already have our average rate of change from zero to three. That was the negative 1.3, whatever that we just got done finding. Okay, awesome. They want to tell us, is the average rate of change over here going to be greater or less than that average rate of change? All right, now here's a couple different things you could do, but the first thing I did was I actually went and graphed it. So I graphed the equation that I built, 75 minus 3.001 times the natural log of t plus one, and I see this graph. So first off, this is a logarithmic graph that is reflected, so that's why we see it going down. So kind of like in general terms, this is exactly what that graph is doing. It's decreasing, and but it's concave up, right? So it's decreasing at a rate that is, well, more and more 
positive. Now, uh, let me explain this for a second. Now, what's the rate of change? Well, the rate of change is negative. If I start looking at rates of change throughout this graph, I see that they are in fact negative. Again, it's definitely decreasing, but those rates of change are increasing, right? Concave up, your rates of change are increasing. They're becoming less and less negative. All of the rates of change are negative because again, it's going down. The retention rate for these students is going down, but it's lessening. So that is why we see that we have an average rate of change that is increasing. So from zero to three, we were definitely going down, but from three to P, we're going to still be going down, but at a lower rate, but because we're negative, that means that my rate of change actually increased. So we can tell from the function we created or the graph of the function that this is a logarithmic function that is decreasing and concave up. Therefore, the average rates of change are increasing. So average rates of change over the interval t equals 3 to t equals p months are greater than the average rate of change from t equals 0 to t equals 3 months. The average rates of change are always negative, but they're less negative over equal length input value intervals as t increases. So I know that could be a little bit, a little bit weird, and, and hopefully maybe even you struggled on that in class a little bit, but the idea is that the rates of change are negative, okay? Definitely negative, they're going down, but they're less negative, which means they increased. And that's why the rate of change after three is going to be greater than the rate of change from zero to three. Part C says the leaders of the study decide to use model R to make predictions about the group score beyond 12 months, which is one year. For a given year, model R is an appropriate model if the group's predicted score at the end of the year is at least one point lower than the group's predicted score at the end of the previous year. Based on this information, for how many years is model R an appropriate model? Give a reason for your answer. And they want you to note here that it's every 12 months. So T is measured in months. So 12 would be one year, 24 would be two years, 36, three years, 48, four years, and so forth. So again, let's emphasize the most important thing here. It says that a, a, your, our model is going to be appropriate if the group's predicted score at the end of the year is at least one point lower than the group's predicted score at the end of the previous year. Now, at least means it could be one or more points lower, but it, it can't be less than one. It's going to be one or more points lower. So how do we answer this question? Well, again, what we need to look at is, well, what happens at the end of 12 months? What happens in the 24 months? And we have to see what that difference was. How much was the change? And again, it's appropriate if the change is one point lower, at least one point lower. So let's take a look at it. So here is me using my equation. Again, I definitely use my calculator here, definitely a calculator-based problem. And I'm going to figure out what happens at 12. So I'm simply going to plug in 12 to my equation, and I get t plus, or 12 plus 1, which is 13. Use my calculator, and I get a score of 67.303. Then I did the exact same thing for what happens at the end of 24 months. At the end of 24 months, I get a score of 65.340. Okay, so now I have to look at the change. Well, the change between those two values was negative 1.963. So it was at least one point lower. So after two, after year two, the predicted score was at least one point lower than after year one. It was actually more than one point lower. And again, you got to understand here, we were looking for it to be at least one point lower. It was more than one point lower. The negative is just the lower. So it was again, the 1.963 is one more than one point lower. Okay, so that means that year two, it would be appropriate to use this model because it fit what means to be appropriate. Now let's check what happens after year three. So now we're going to redo year two. So once again, year two was after 24 months. We already knew that. And then now we're going to look at the end of three years, which is 36 months, and we have 64.164. So once again, looking at the difference between those two times or, the, or those two scores, we still get a value that is at least one point lower. Once again, it's again, it's actually more than one point lower, but that's okay because it says at least one point lower. All right, so now we're going to repeat that again. This time we're going to look at what happens after year three and after year four. So once again, we already know what happens after year three. That was plugging in 36, 64.164. Now we're going to figure out what happens after year four, which is 48 months, and we get 63.321. So now the difference there is 
oh, it's not less than one point lower. It's, it's smaller. It's only negative 0.843. And we were told that it's only an appropriate model if it's at least one point lower. Again, that's more than one point lower and, and we're not. So this is where we finally hit the end, right? We finally realized that after year three, it's, well, no longer good. So after year four, the predicted score was less than one point lower than after year three. Therefore, the model is only appropriate for T equals zero to T equals 36 months or for the first three years. For the first three years, we've proven that the model is appropriate. After that, it just doesn't work with what they say. They say that we need to be at least one point lower, but between year four and year three, we, we miss that requirement. So that is why it would no longer be appropriate to use the model after three years. All right, that's it for this question. But again, remember the framework here. So we're given a, a problem. We're given a scenario. Part A, we actually had to create the model. They gave us the equation. We just had to create two different equations based on the information. Then we solved, forgot what our parameters were, so we actually had our model. Part B focused on rates of change, and then part C focused on how do we know if our model is appropriate or not. And that's exactly what's going to happen when you open up and take a look at that second FRQ. It's not going to be the exact same problem as this, but it's going to be that exact same framework of build a model, answer some questions about average rate of change, and answer some questions about appropriateness. All right, hopefully this problem worked out for you and hopefully made a lot of sense. We'll see you in the next video.